Good morning. How's everybody doing? We're good? All right. Y'all sound a little bit better than 9 a.m. Y'all doing all right? All right. Uh, well, I want to welcome those of you that are watching online and from our different locations. Uh, it's good to be together uh, under God's word uh, today. Um, we are uh, finishing up 21 days of prayer. This is our last Sunday uh, of 21 days of prayer. And if you feel like you've kind of missed out, maybe you haven't uh, fully taken advantage of 21 days of prayer the way you uh, wanted to, the good news is there's nothing special about 21 days. We just made it up, all right? So God is still going to be available on day 22, and, uh, and all the resources that we have um, pulled together will be still available to you. You can access them at mclanebible.org slash prayer. We built that website to kind of be a go-to resource for you to help you grow uh, in, in your prayer life. Uh, but as we close out these 21 days, I want us to spend some time in Luke chapter 10. So go to Luke 10. Hope you got a Bible uh, with you. Uh, if you don't, we'll have the verses up on the screen. But while you make your way there, let me ask you something. Have you ever uh, just looked at the spin cycle uh, on your washing machine? Anybody? You don't want to admit it, but it's not just me, and it's not just your kids either. It's mesmerizing. Once you look, you can't look away. You're just looking at the spin cycle. I don't know why it's so fascinating, uh, but it is completely just mesmerizing. And uh, we recently in my family had a problem with our washing machine. I guess one of the little rods or something like that broke, but the problem was our washing machine kept getting stuck in the spin cycle. So if you've had that problem before, what happens is it gets stuck in a spin cycle, and especially if you have something heavy in it, like a, a comforter or a jacket or whatever the case may be, uh, you'll be in a completely separate part of the house, and all of a sudden, some of y'all already laugh because you already know, you will just hear this rumbling, like just this banging, and you're going around your house trying to figure out what it is, and your washing machine is violently shaking. The little thing in it is just going crazy. Everything is off balance. It's making all of this noise. Uh, and so thankfully, we were able to get that fixed. But I'm standing there, and I'm looking at this thing. I'm looking at everything inside going this way and that way, and the water going crazy, and, and, and it's banging, and there's so much noise. And I'm looking at it, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if this is what God sees when he looks at our lives. I wonder if, if this is what he sees sometimes when he looks at our churches, because I don't know about you, but sometimes my life feels like the spin cycle. Amen. Sometimes my life feels like it's in this spin cycle. We're overcommitted, constantly distracted. Some of y'all resonate with this, and if the research is true, a lot of us resonate with this. Think about it just for, for a second. Like, how many times have you checked your phone since this service started? Since the sermon started. <laughs> like, I legit was going to name this sermon, Your Phone is Killing Your Prayer Life. Because it's a problem. In fact, psychologists are now talking about an epidemic that we're experiencing in the modern world. They call it hurry sickness. Yes. They literally label this a disease, and it was actually coined by a world-renowned cardiologist in the 1950s. Hurry sickness. It's go, go, go. It's where you always are rushed, and you constantly feel like you never have enough time. Life feels frenetic and chaotic, like you're always under pressure. They call it hurry sickness. I call it the spin cycle. And John Mark Homer lists some of the symptoms of the spin cycle in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Listen to some of the symptoms that he talks about. Irritability. You get mad or frustrated or just annoyed way too easily. Little normal things irk you. And it makes sense because when you're in the spin cycle, everything feels like an inconvenience. So you just get annoyed all the time. Restlessness. When you actually do try to slow down and rest, you can't relax. You give Sabbath a try. You hate it. You read scripture. You find it boring. You have quiet time with God, but you can't focus your mind. You go to bed early, but you toss and turn with anxiety. Restlessness. Workaholism. Not just in your job, but 
with nonstop activity in general. You just don't know when to stop. He says, your drugs of choice are accomplishment and accumulation. Amen. Out of order priorities. Mm -hmm. You feel disconnected from your identity and your calling. Your life is reactive, not proactive. You're busier than ever before, yet still feel like you don't have time for what really matters to you. Lack of care for your body. Escapist behaviors. Here's what he means. He says, when we're too tired to do what's actually life-giving for our souls, we turn, each of us, we turn to our distraction of choice. So it might be overeating or overdrinking or binge watching Netflix or watching social media or, or, or scrolling or surfing the web, looking at pornography. Whatever helps you to feel like you're escaping the spin cycle, there's this escapist behaviors or, he says, slippage of spiritual disciplines. He says when you get over busy, the thing, listen to what he says. He says the things that are truly life-giving for your soul are the first to go rather than your first go-to. You know it's the stuff that's actually better for your soul. But when you're over busy, that's the, that's the stuff that's first to go, rather than it being your first go-to. Like, these are all symptoms that you're stuck in the spin cycle. Does any of that describe your life? Here's a better question. Do you still want that to describe your life? Because I don't. I don't. And I think one of the greatest opportunities that Christians have in our culture, there's a lot of opportunities, y'all to bear witness to the kingdom of God and what a life in relationship with God looks like. There's a lot of things we can do, sexual purity and like all this, all these things are great. Let me tell you this, I think one of the most compelling opportunities we have as Christians is to model something different, something better, to model for the world what life looks like with God outside of the spin cycle. I think that is one of the most evangelistic opportunities we have, particularly in D.C. culture, to show the world what life looks like outside of the spin cycle. And so in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, Jesus is about to say something that I think has the potential to completely change your life. No exaggeration. I'm not hyping it up at all. I literally think this one thing Jesus is about to say could completely change your life. But here's the thing is something that you probably won't immediately agree with. At first, you're just going to have to trust Jesus enough to believe it until you actually experience it for yourself. So you ready to hear it? We re that wasn't rhetorical. We ready? Locations, we ready? We ready? All right. Let's dive in. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. This is God's word. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village... And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Now pause for a second. We all understand. We all got that family member that disappears when it's time to clean up. All of us have that. We've all been done the group project, right? And that person didn't get the emails, and we got to jump in. This is how this is how Martha's feeling. Verse forty-one. But the Lord answered her and said, "Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Here it is. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion." which will not be taken away from her. Now, Luke doesn't give us a lot of extra detail about these ladies, Martha and Mary, but we learn several things about them in John chapter 11. You don't have to turn there, but let me just give you this brief summary. So John tells us that Martha lives in Bethany, which is a small town about two miles from Jerusalem, and she lives with her younger sister Mary and probably also their brother Lazarus. And what's interesting is that even in John 11, you can see a bit of a contrast in how these two sisters relate to Jesus. They both love and serve Jesus in their own ways. And I had never noticed this until studying this this week, but 
every time I was able to see Mary mentioned, this is not Mary the mother of Jesus, this is Martha's sister Mary, every time I see her mentioned, particularly in John's gospel, but Mary is always at Jesus' feet. So in John 11 and 12, she's worshiping at Jesus' feet. Two separate times where out of profound reverence, remember she had been saved and rescued out of this just scandalous lifestyle, she anoints Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair. This is that Mary. In John chapter 11, verse 32, she's grieving at Jesus' feet after her brother Lazarus dies. And you remember later on, Lazarus, uh, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And then here in Luke chapter 10, she's learning at Jesus' feet, which is completely countercultural for that time. As a woman in that culture, Mary should be with Martha in the kitchen while the men sit with Jesus. But women aren't second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. Ladies, can I get an amen? Amen. Right? They're not second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. So Mary takes the position of a disciple listening to and learning from Jesus. But Martha was missing out on the opportunity to stop and enjoy the presence of Jesus. She's doing all of these good things, and she's not even aware of the toll that is taking on her soul. So look at how she's described in Luke chapter 10, verse 40. It says she's distracted. And that word distracted in the original language is a very descriptive word. It means to be pulled or to be dragged away. And I read one writer who said this, and I had to research it for myself, but there there was actually a form of torture in the Middle Ages where they would take a man's limbs, tie them to four horses, and send them on their way. We'll just leave it, just let your imagination fill in the gaps, right? You know what the French called this form of torture? Distraction. That man was being distracted. (laughs) You ever felt that way in your spiritual life? Like you want to spend time with God, you want to grow in your prayer life, but you feel pulled in so many different directions and your intimacy with God just gets lost in the midst of it. And that's what's happening to Martha. And listen, it's not like she's distracted with something sinful or selfish. No, she's distracted, look at verse 40, with much serving. Like serving and showing hospitality was a good thing. It was a good thing culturally. It's, it's a good thing biblically. And I think it was a good thing for her personally. I think she enjoyed serving Jesus and she genuinely wanted to, to make him feel honored and appreciated and cared for. These are all good things. And the problem isn't that she's serving Jesus. The problem is that she doesn't know when to stop and just sit with Jesus. And the same thing is happening to so many of us. We're so busy doing good things that we're missing out on the thing we need more than anything. Listen, you can get by on that for a while. You can get by on that for a while. But saying I'm too busy to spend time with God is is like saying I'm too busy to breathe. If you really want to follow Jesus. Saying I'm too busy to spend time with God is like saying I'm too busy to eat, I'm too busy to sleep. And our culture is so jacked up that some of y'all are like, the breathing thing I do regularly. But I actually am too busy to eat and to sleep. Here's the thing. You know and I know. You can get by on that for a while. And the same thing is true spiritually. And you might even be able to live an outwardly impressive life. And you may not even feel the spiritual effects at first, but at some point it will catch up to you. Your soul will begin to starve. Your faith will begin to wither. And you might even be actively serving in ministry, but privately. And listen, I know what this is like. You might be actively serving in ministry, but privately you will begin to feel spiritually and emotionally distant from God. 
Martha is distracted. And then when she compares herself to Mary, she becomes increasingly resentful. So look at verse 40. It says, she went up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Like, you see what she's saying. Like, she's scrolling through Instagram, and she's looking at Mary's feet. Mary is taking selfies at Jesus' feet. And Martha wishes there was an unlike button, but that she don't want to seem super petty. So she, she posts a fake comment. She's like, oh. <laughs> Tell Jesus, I said, hey, it's fake. She's comparing her life to Mary's life and getting more and more resentful towards her. And then that resentment turns toward Jesus. And she basically says, Lord, Mary is living her best life, but what about me? And this is what distraction does. This is what distraction does. Listen, she is in the presence of Jesus, but focusing on Mary. She's in the presence of Jesus, but all she can do is compare herself in that moment. And then Jesus responds to her with tenderness and with compassion and says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Like she's distracted, increasingly resentful, and she is stressed out. All the things she's doing that started out with good intentions have now become overwhelming. She's just continued to add more and more good things, not sinful things, more and more good things to her life. And the problem is those things are starting to crowd out the most important thing. She's stuck in the spin cycle. And Jesus says to her something that has the potential to completely change your life. But you have to trust Jesus enough to actually believe it and build your life on it. And we already read it in verse 42. Jesus says, one thing is necessary. One thing is necessary. And listen to me. The quality of your spiritual life will be determined by whether or not you believe that. You can go to church, you can read a bunch of Christian books, you can serve in a bunch of ministries, all of that. I'm telling you, the quality of your spiritual life will be determined by whether or not you believe what Jesus just said in Luke chapter 10, verse 42. That one thing is necessary. And here's how I summarize that. This is the main point of this entire message. The thing you need more than anything is intimacy with God. The thing you and I need more than anything is intimacy with God. Receiving God's word, responding in prayer, resting in the Savior's love. And the point of this sermon as we close out 21 days of prayer, the point of this sermon isn't really to get you to do anything. First and foremost, I'm trying to get you to believe something, to believe what Jesus just said. The one who created you, the one, if you're in Christ, who redeemed you, he looks at you and me just like he looked at Martha. And he says, the thing you need more than anything is intimacy with God. And so this is not just... Another sermon telling you to have a quiet time. You should have a quiet time. But I think most of us as Christians, we know we should have a daily quiet time. The problem is that when we think about that, we tend to think about that as just one thing on a long list of all the other things we need to do. So when you hear people tell you, you need to spend more time with God, what you tend to hear is, I have to try to fit that into my already overwhelmed life. So I'm not just telling you to have a daily quiet time. I'm trying to help you change the way you think about your whole life based on what Jesus says here in Luke chapter 10, verse 42. Your primary need in life is intimacy with God. Your primary calling in life is intimacy with God. 
And when you see your life that way, quiet time alone with God just helps you focus on continual intimacy with God throughout the rest of your day in the midst of all the other things that we got to do because there are employees that need to be met with and diapers that need to be changed and students that need to be taught and all these things that we have to do. But there's this conviction, right, that the the thing we need more than anything is intimacy with God. And so here's what I want to do with the time that we have left. We got a bunch of resources on that website I mentioned, mcclainbible.org slash prayer to help you think through what this could look like for you personally and practically. David led us last week, like we, we just did it during, during the sermon time. We, he, he led us practically through what it looks like to spend time with God in prayer based on his word. And those resource, more resources there that can help you figure out what that looks like practically. But with the time we have left, I just want to try to help you want more intimacy with God. I want to help you see why intimacy with God is the thing you need more than anything. Because I think the fundamental problem, I know it's true in my own life, is that we struggle to actually believe that. And so I just want to walk us through what you experience if you truly prioritize intimacy with God. So here's the first thing, more clarity. Like more clarity in your life. And here's what I mean. When you travel to other countries, a lot of times they'll have these open air, like, marketplaces. Anybody seen those before? You kind of walk through and you can buy all kinds of stuff, right? All kinds of local keepsakes, everything from handmade jewelry to handmade toys and all, all kinds of different things. And you walk up and down these aisles that are jam packed with vendors, and they are all yelling at you, which seems like a very bad business model to me, but maybe not, because I always come back home with all this stuff, right? You're walking down the aisles in this marketplace, and everybody is yelling at you and trying to get you to come to their booth and look at their stuff, and some of y'all are like, I've never been to one of those marketplaces, but that sounds like my house. I understand, right? To be honest, that sounds like the whole world right now. Like, everywhere we go, there's this constant, like, cacophony of voices, like, pressing in on us, all yelling their opinions at us, advertising their products to us, trying to impose their values on us. The voices of social media, of the news, of our friends and coworkers, of bosses and parents and professors and therapists and pastors and crying children, the voice of the CDC and the BBC and the NBA and whatever acronym you want, right? All these voices, and not just the voices around us, but also the voices that are constantly rising up inside of us. Like voices from the past that are still affecting us today. The voice of our restless ambition or our chronic insecurities, the voice of self-loathing and comparison. And the problem is that we can get to the point where all of those voices drown out God's voice. And often we don't even realize it because we, we don't even remember or ne- we, we, maybe we never even knew how to recognize God's voice in the midst of all the noise. And so we live our lives constantly reacting to the noise, confused about what God wants us to do, unclear about what's most important. And so everybody's expectations become your priorities. And this is why when you read the Gospels, as we're reading through, uh, the, 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 been reading through the Gospels together and we've been preaching through the Gospel of Mark, it says Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Amen. Like away from the noise and away from the opinions and the demands and all the needs, alone with God the Father. And what happens is when you prioritize, when you begin to prioritize that kind of quietness in the presence of God, then the Holy Spirit begins to help you sort and sift through all of the different voices. And some of us are so confused about life because we won't slow down in the presence of God. And the Holy Spirit will become a sort of like sound engineer in your life. 
like adjusting the levels, turning up the volume of God's voice, of God's truth and wisdom and guidance. We see this all over the Psalms where people come in and everything is so loud. Their fears and anxieties and frustrations and circumstances are so loud. And by the end of the Psalm, what's the loudest thing? The character and the promises of God. Listen, God wants to give you more clarity. He wants to give you more clarity about how he wants you to apply his word. More clarity about decisions that you're wrestling with. Clarity about the direction of your life. Clarity about the situations and emotions that you're struggling with. And that kind of clarity grows out of intimacy with God. But also more correction. He wants to give you more correction as you, as you prioritize intimacy with him, which may sound a little bit weird. Like, who wants more correction, right? But just hear me out. Have you ever, you ever been driving your car and realized, like, the alignment is off? Like, I used to drive, like, when I started dating Ashley, my like, I used to drive some beat-up cars. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a college student. I don't got time or money uh, to go get this fixed. And so you're driving, and the car keeps pulling to the left or keeps pulling to the right. And you got two choices. You can either go, like, fix the core issue, or you can just try to manage it and just drive with a crooked steering wheel. <laughs> like, I get in your car, why are you driving like this? You're supposed to be a 10 and 2. Why, why are you here? <clears throat> the same thing is true of our hearts and of our lives. Like, all of us have sinful inclinations and unhealthy patterns of thinking that constantly pull us off course. And sometimes we don't really know what's going on beneath the surface. This is why David comes before God, Psalm 139, 23. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David says, God, I need an alignment. Show me what the core issues are. And God can use people like our parents or pastors or good friends or counselors to help us with this. But sometimes the Holy Spirit will reveal some of these things to us as we slow down to hear from him. So can I, can I give you a really honest example? It's not rhetorical, yes? I need permission. I need permission. Please make this a safe space for me, all right? Let me give you a really honest example. And I hope, I hope the elders took this Sunday off. Um, but there was a, a situation um, where I was so frustrated by a decision that the elders made, and I had to submit to that decision. Like, don't look at me like that. Don't, you, don't look at me like you think we just always agree. Like, it's a job just like your job, okay? And so they made a decision, and I was frustrated and had to submit to that decision. So kids, you've experienced this before with your parents. We've experienced it in our jobs or in our marriage. We all know what that feels like, and you know how that goes. I was rehearsing that anger and frustration over and over, I'm, I'm like mumbling underneath my breath to myself about how I'm right and how they're wrong. And I was so frustrated. The alignment was off. And so I did what the psalmist invites us to do. Pour out your heart to God. Practically for me, that's through journaling. I'm writing out what's happening and, and what I'm feeling and thinking and I'm processing and I'm, and I'm praying about that. And it's in the midst of that, in the quietness of the presence of God, that the Holy Spirit brings 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 to my mind. No lie, it's a true story. Let me tell you what 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says. This is just like what the Holy Spirit would do. It says this, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Amen. See, I thought I was so frustrated because I was right. Now, in hindsight, I look back and actually they were right, but I didn't know that at the time. In that moment, though, I thought I was frustrated because I was right. And it wasn't until I slowed down in the presence of God that the Holy Spirit, through his word, showed me, you're not frustrated because you're right. You're frustrated because you're prideful, because you're stubborn. The Holy Spirit just revealed to me what's really going on is your pride. 
And I had to confess that and repent from that. The Holy Spirit gave me an alignment. He corrected me, and God will correct us and lead us back onto the path of abundant life when we slow down long enough to let him show us what's really going on underneath the surface. So more correction, but also more comfort. Like you'll experience more comfort when you prioritize intimacy with God. Listen, just like Martha, some of us are anxious and we are troubled about many things. Some of us are grieving. I think about a young couple at Arlington right now who has two boys and has a brand new baby girl that's less than two weeks old. And she has all these heart issues and she's already had several different surgeries and she's on an ECMO machine right now. And they're exhausted, trying to care for the boys, trying to be at the hospital with their brand new baby girl. And everything feels up in the air and they're just grieving. Some of you are grieving. Some of you are discouraged and depressed. And by God's grace, listen, there's natural remedies to help with the heartaches we experience in life. There's therapy, there's medicine, there's exercise, there's spending time with people we love. But listen, listen, there is also a supernatural comfort and peace that can only come from dwelling in the presence of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to minister his word to our hearts. I'm telling you, some of y'all already know what I'm talking about because you've experienced it. It's difficult to describe, but I'm just telling you, there is a supernatural comfort and a peace that surpasses understanding that only God can give you. These are the moments where we are aware at a deep level that God is with you and you are with God. Not just in general, but right there in that moment. And the more focused you are on his sovereignty, the less and less you feel the need to be in control. The more focused you are on how good and gracious and merciful he is, the less focused you become on the challenges. The more focused you are on his glory and majesty, the less concerned you become about the temporary things of this world. And something mysterious and supernatural begins to happen. The Holy Spirit begins to ease the burden on your heart. Begins to minister healing and comfort and peace and strength. And it's not that he immediately changes everything wrong in your life, but he changes you. Like he frees you from the chokehold. The chokehold of grief. It's not that the grief is gone. It's that it doesn't have a chokehold anymore. This is the supernatural ministry of the Holy Spirit to our hearts. And I think this is what King David experienced in 1 Samuel chapter 30 when he is in the depths of depression. And it says in verse 6 that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. We don't get details of what that looked like, but the whole book of Psalms is filled with examples of how David brought his pain and frustration to God in prayer, and in worshipful surrender, he found supernatural comfort. And God wants you, listen, God wants you to have that kind of comfort. And also more courage. Because, listen, sometimes God is going to call you to do some things that are absolutely terrifying. Terrifying. Like telling your friends or family that you're a Christian, getting baptized, quitting your job, teaching or preaching, leading a group or a ministry, starting a business, going back to school, adopting a child, sharing the gospel, ending an unhealthy relationship. Sometimes God's going to call you to do some things that are terrifying, and you know it's what God wants you to do, but you're afraid of what will happen if you do it. Or you worry, you worry that you don't have what it takes. And so many people in the Bible felt that way. So many men and women in the Bible felt that way. And over and over again, while they're alone with God, God reminds them of why they can move forward in his will with courage. Remember what he said to Joshua, Joshua 1.9. He says, have I not commanded you? You know what I'm calling you to do. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
As you spend time with God, he'll give you the courage you need to follow him. And here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. And maybe the most important thing that you'll experience as you prioritize intimacy with God. More joy. More joy. I couldn't come up with another C. After the 9 a.m., people were texting me all kinds of different C words, right? But you'll experience more joy. Here's why. Here's why. Because you were made for intimacy with God. Amen. Listen to me. I'm not just talking to Christians. I'm talking to every single person who hears this message. You were made for intimacy with God, your creator. This is what you, this is what you were made for. Like God created humanity in his image, and his desire was for them and for all of us to live in his presence, enjoying intimate fellowship with him as our creator and king. And here's the problem. Our sin has separated us from God and introduced distance and resistance into our relationship with God. And yet God loved humanity so much that he established a covenant relationship with the ancient people of Israel. And listen, he instructed them to build a tabernacle and later a temple where he would dwell among them, blessing them, forgiving them, providing for them, guiding them, protecting them. But that was just a temporary solution. Because ultimately, God does not dwell in imperfect temples made by human hands. No, we needed a permanent solution. We needed a perfect solution, a way to experience and enjoy the presence of God. And so Jesus, the Son of God, came wrapped in human flesh. The presence of God made visible and accessible, not in a place, but in a person. And he lived a sinless life to fulfill the law that you and I have broken. And he died as a perfect sacrifice to take the judgment that you and I deserve. And he rose from the dead and intercedes for us from heaven. And now, because of his work on our behalf, we can not only be forgiven of our sin, but we can enjoy his presence and experience the intimate indwelling power of his Holy Spirit. And it gets even better from there because one day God himself will once again make earth his physical dwelling place and we will enjoy his presence with no interruptions, no distractions, no temptations. Listen, this is what you were made for. This is what you were made for. This is literally the reason you were created. It's the reason you've been redeemed if you're in Christ. It's the reason you will one day be glorified so that you can enjoy intimacy with God. And listen, our joy in him brings him joy. Our joy in him brings him glory because our joy in him shows the world that nothing else is better than him. Our joy in him shows the world that one day is better in his course than a thousand elsewhere. Our joy in him shows the world that he is able to put more joy in our hearts than they have when their way and grind abound. Our joy in him shows the world that in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Our joy in God brings glory to God. You and I need more than anything is intimacy with God. So the invitation, the challenge is for you and I to make Intimacy with God, the number one goal of our life. Because it's what we were made for. To make intimacy with God the number one goal in your life. Whether you're experiencing success or suffering, busyness or boredom, make intimacy with God the number one goal of your life. Now, I know what some of y'all are already thinking. Like I think about our healthcare professionals. This has been one of the most stressful and busy times in your whole career over these last two years during this pandemic. And you're working long shifts and you're coming back and you're fried and tired and then you're back on call, you got to get back. I think about moms with young kids. And you're like, I mean, that's nice that Jesus got away to, to quiet, lonely places. I don't have that place. Like my wife will tell you straight up, like not even the bathroom because the kid is going to siege the bathroom, right? 
But I want you to hear this as a gracious invitation from God, not a condemning invitation from God, because this is going to look different in different seasons and in different situations. What I'm talking about, and I think what Jesus is talking about here is this has to become a mindset. It has to become a non-negotiable conviction for you. The thing you need more than anything is intimacy with God. So you may not be able to wake up at 10 a.m. and and have a long brunch and spend the, the afternoon in quiet meditation. You may not be able to do all that. Okay. God is not, like, demanding all of that from you in every season of your life. But when this becomes your conviction, the thing I need more than anything is intimacy with God. The number one goal of my life is to enjoy intimacy with God. When that becomes the fundamental conviction, it changes everything in your life. It changes the way you change diapers. It changes the way you show up to work. It changes what you do while you're driving your car or on the metro. It changes. This is one of the reasons why I, I, I have a social media rhythm where I'm off social media one day a week, one week a month, one month a year, and, and I'm, January is my month off. So in a couple of days, I'm supposed to be back on. I'm not even sure yet if I'm coming back on, right? But one of the things I've loved in, in it and one of the things I've learned in this rhythm is how much more often I'm inclined to pray in down moments as opposed to just grabbing my phone. I'm not saying you got to spend three hours every morning. I'm saying you're making the goal of your life to enjoy intimacy with your creator and your redeemer, your heavenly father who loves you. And so you get it anywhere you can. You don't have to walk around feeling shame and judgment and all that because you can't do it the same way everybody else does it. But you take up God's invitation. Parents, what would it look like for you to model this for your kids so that intimacy with God becomes normal for them? Like one of my greatest concerns is that intimacy with God is not normal for most Christians. Church, what would it look like if we modeled for the world what life outside of the spin cycle looks like? What would it look like if we modeled a life where intimacy with God characterizes our lives and we have more clarity and and correction as we're becoming more like Jesus and comfort and courage and joy? What would it look like if we modeled that to the world? Listen, I'm going to invite the band that to come out, and one of the things we recommended during these 21 days of prayer is something called a prayer retreat, and it's just, you know, spending extended time in prayer. And I want to end with a paragraph from the prayer retreat guide. You can find it on the mcclainbible.org slash prayer website, but this is a helpful reminder to me is personally, when I slow down and I pause to be alone with God, And I just want to read this over you. And so as I read this, whether you're here, wherever you're watching from, I want to invite you to just just close your eyes. Just close your eyes because I want you to just take this personally. Just listen. Listen to this. Guess what? God is with you right now in this moment. He knows everything about you. He knows everything happening in your life. He knows everything happening in your heart. He knows what's worrying you. He knows what's tempting you. He knows what's frustrating you. He knows you. And right now, in this moment, he loves you. He is glad to be here with you. He has been looking forward to spending this time with you because he delights in you. He wants to hear from you, and he has some things he wants to share with you. So as you begin this time with him, it's important to remember who he is, almighty God and gracious redeemer. But it's just as important to remember who you are in his eyes. In Christ, you are his beloved daughter, his beloved son, and you were made to enjoy intimacy with him. 
Let's pray together. And I want to give you just a moment to pray on your own. I just want to invite you here, wherever you're listening or watching from, to just talk to God about whatever's on your heart as you process this message. You can begin just doing that now. And and if you're here or watching and you've never truly put your trust in Jesus as your Savior and King, but you want to begin a personal relationship with God today, then I want to invite you to do two things. One, I want you to take a moment to pray. Also, I want you to just tell God that you are putting your trust in Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and that you want to begin a relationship with God. Just tell him that. And then afterwards, in just a few minutes, as we're wrapping up, I want you to text the number on your screen or talk to somebody in the lobby at your location and tell them that you are making a decision to trust in Jesus. We want to help you and support you as you grow in your relationship with God. So just in the quietness of your own heart, just take a minute between you and God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of your presence. That we don't just have to know about you, but that we can be with you. The only reason we can be with you is because Jesus has made a way. The veil has been torn. We can come before your throne of grace with boldness. And what a gift that we can be confident, God, that you are with us. You are with us, Lord, not to condemn or to judge us, but in Christ you are with us to bless us. You are with us to to bring joy to our hearts and to make us more like Jesus. And God, we confess that it's so easy for us to be pushed and to be pulled by so many other things, to prioritize so many other things that, God, we, we lose sight of the thing that is most important, you and enjoying intimacy with you. And so, God, we ask for your forgiveness in that. We, we ask that you forgive us, God, for forsaking our first love. And, God, would you help us, Holy Spirit, would you give us wisdom to know how to truly live this out in our particular circumstance or the particular season of our life, would you guide us and give us wisdom? Would you send people around us who are a little bit older or have a little bit more experience walking with you who can help us practically figure this out? And God, I pray for any person here listening, watching, who genuinely desires to begin a relationship with you and genuinely is believing the gospel and trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin as the only way to eternal life and a relationship with you, God, I pray that you would be faithful to save them, to begin them on this wonderful journey of intimacy with you that starts today and last, God, for all of eternity. Thank you for this gracious invitation. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.